Okay, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open them to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. I've entitled this series, From the Garden to the Grave. So we're going to start, pick up tonight, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus praying there with his disciples. And we will kind of fast forward all the way to the crucifixion. And uh, I, well, we won't necessarily fast forward. We'll just we're gonna we will study all of that together. So, um, but we'll begin tonight in Luke 22 verses 39 through 53. So I'm gonna read that for us now. And he, that is Jesus, and he came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not yours, but not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from the prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when they were all around him, uh, and when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who'd come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you, oh, excuse me, when I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, speak now, for we are listening. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we begin this study tonight, I want us to just state three goals that I have from the outset. This is kind of, as I'm, as I'm studying these passages, and even as you study them, you can kind of have these things in mind as well. Uh, namely, that I want this to be a time for us as we read these passages, read these texts, and we, we're just going to walk sequentially through this. So after our passage today, we finished in verse 53. Look in your Bible where the paragraph breaks are. Next week, we're going to look at verses 54 to 62. So uh, you'll, we'll get to continue that. But um, I want us to first think about Jesus. Right? We're going to focus on our Lord, and we're going to think about what does what he endures, what does what he does, how does that relate to his saving work in our lives? Secondly, I want us to think about the response of the people around Jesus, primarily his disciples, and I want, to, I want us to reflect upon our own discipleship and our own following of Jesus. And finally, especially as we consider the passion of Jesus together, I want us to grow in humility as we consider his lowliness. This is a a, a, a season, or a, a scene in the life of Jesus and the Gospels where he is um, regularly degraded and he is um, treated as someone of little importance. Uh, he's lowly. And so I just want us to think about humility in particular. So I just wanted to say that, that, that that's our goal as we begin this study. That I, that's going to govern my objective for every lesson, and I think that's my objective for the whole thing. So I want to do that. So as we pick up our scene, the Last Supper has just happened, and Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives to pray. It says he went there, as was his custom, which is interesting, and it says he went to the place, like not a place, but he went to the place, which is a specific place. Um, I think I told you all, four years ago, we had the privilege of, to go to Israel, and we spent by four or five days in Jerusalem. And uh, it's a tight-knit city, you know, it's before the suburban sprawl permitted you to just have a bunch of houses spread out over miles and miles and miles. Uh, they packed it in real tight. And uh, that goes back thousands of years and continued till today. But you go to the old city of Jerusalem, to the Temple Mount, and, and you can just see uh, 
the Mount of Olives just that cross a little ravine. It's not like miles and miles away. It would only take about 15 minutes to walk the approximately half a mile um, from where they would have had this meal to the Mount of Olives. So it's the Passover night, they've had that meal, they've taken the Last Supper together, and they go out to pray. It's probably 10 or 11 at night later uh, in the evening. And uh, it would have been a normal thing for the for families to stay up and pray late on the night of Passover. So that wasn't particularly strange, but they went to the Mount of Olives. Um, and the Mount of Olives is a place of significance. It gets more significance in the era right before the New Testament. Uh, Zechariah in Zechariah 14 kind of put, says that that's the place where the Messiah is going to return from, is on the Mount of Olives. And uh, in the period leading up to the New Testament, it's where a lot of graves for Jewish people will start to be built. So uh, it's, it was not common in antiquity for people to bury their dead. You normally would burn the dead or dispose of the body some way. But Jewish people were unique in that they always buried their dead in anticipation of the resurrection. So if you go to the Mount of Olives today, there still are just graves, tons and tons of graves. I have a picture that I probably should have brought. It's a thing that I... It doesn't matter how I got it, but it's like it shows a view from the Mount of Olives over towards Jerusalem, and it's taken like about 60 years ago, so there's not as much development around. You can still see the lay of the land, but it's it's not far. So they went to pray in the Mount of Olives. I want to tell one story before I go on. Uh, this isn't really related to the lesson. So we, whenever we went to the Mount of Olives, you can still go. They have a little garden there that has olive trees, and um, I was with a group. There's a bunch of tour groups from all over the world. And, you know, you'll see Indian Christians there. You'll see African Christians, European Christians. I mean, you'll see from everywhere there. It's all speaking their own languages. We, we go into this private garden on the Mount of Olives. It's got olives. It's a kind of a place you can go pray and stuff. And uh, our tour guide is leading us there. And the group from my seminary. And as we're, like, going in, one of our seminary professors who wasn't with us walks out. <laughs> our preaching professor. And he, he was there with a group from his church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, just happened to be at the same place at the same time. Uh, that was a divine appointment for certain uh, as we got to be with him. But back to the lesson then. Was it in the springtime? No, it was in the summer. It was like, well, it was like late May. So I guess technically it's spring, but it was summer there. So as they get to the garden, Jesus, he's a teacher. I want, again, I want us to focus on Jesus. Jesus is a teacher and he teaches his disciples, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And that word temptation it's always a tricky word to translate in the New Testament because it can sometimes mean being tempted, but it can also sometimes mean being tested or being tried for something. So it's the same word that's used whenever Jesus is tempted in the, in the wilderness in uh, Luke chapter 4, Mark chapter 1, uh, Matthew chapter 3, or maybe, maybe that's Matthew 4. It's the same word that's used whenever we pray the Lord's Prayer and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil one. Um, in some translations, not into English, but in some other languages, when they translate that, they translate it as more of testing, less than temptation. So it's, you could go either way on this. Is he instructing them to pray that they not enter into temptation more generally? I mean, we can certainly derive that lesson from here. Or he knows that they're about to go a tr undergo a trial. And so he's saying, pray that you might not enter into that. I think both ways are, are good, but he's aware of the challenges that are to come, and he wants them to be aware. If you remember in Jesus' ministry, there are three times where he tells his disciples that the Son of Man is going to suffer and be killed. Right? And those are very pivotal moments in the Gospels uh, whenever you see Jesus mention that with his disciples. I'm, I'm less familiar with those passages in Luke, but I know in Mark, it's like Mark chapter 8 through chapter 10, maybe through chapter 11. It's these revelations. The Son of Man is going to be rejected and suffer at the hands of the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and be delivered over to be killed. And then on the third day, he'll rise again. And there, the disciples are kind of like, what? You know, like they don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't understand what he's saying. But he is aware of this trial that is to come. And he's also aware that it's about to come soon. Okay, that's why he partook of the meal. And remember, remember what he says whenever he takes the last supper with them. He says, you know, uh, I will not again partake of this. I won't drink any more wine until I'm with you in the kingdom. Uh, and some people mean think that means maybe after his resurrection. Some people think it means in the future. Either way, he knows that it's soon. And as you read in Luke 22, 
there would get to be a lot more frequent parallels to the passage of the suffering servant, which we studied about a month ago from Isaiah 52 and 53. Um, and so we know that Jesus has this on mind. But I want us to focus on how he prays. And I've entitled this section, Agony, the Struggle of Prayer. Uh, Jonathan doesn't do this, and I, 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 I may have told him not to do it. I don't know. But uh, there, there's a thing that happens often in church, and it's not a bad thing. So this is a, I'm, I'm talking out of preference only. But whenever someone goes to pray, if there's a pianist sitting over at the piano, they'll start playing some chords, you know, light music. And, I, and that reflects, I think, uh, the reason I don't like it is because it distracts me. I'm used to not praying with that, so then whenever the chords are going, I just my mind gets scrambled. That's just me. But, uh, but it helps us, you know, I think it's trying to set a, a mood, right? It's trying to help us to think this is a somber time, reverent, perhaps even serene as we reflect before God. But that is not like the way Jesus prays here. I'm not, again, I'm not saying that's wrong. But I want us to look at the anxiety uh, that Jesus experiences, right? It's, his, it's so intense, we're told that he was like, it's like he was sweating great drops of blood. And so I want us to think about three lessons in how Jesus prays in his words. So first we have the very famous prayer of holy acceptance. Okay, Father, let the, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. He knows the cup of God's wrath and judgment is going to come. Nevertheless, not what I will, but your will be done. So one of the things that he's praying through, and again, knowing what knowing the agony that is around the corner this is kind of the beginning of that suffering it's not just like preparing for it it's actually starting to enter into that and so we see that even in this moment jesus is receiving from the lord and it's not easy and that's why i think we see these two other things the prayer that jesus has it's a spiritual battle and we know so because we're told that god had to send an angel to sustain jesus while he prayed another episode we see where Jesus is in spiritual warfare, and God sends an angel is in the temptation. In Mark's account, and we just get two, it's the shortest account of the temptation of Jesus. But in Mark 11 and 13, or sorry, Mark chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, uh, you know, it's Jesus was in the wilderness, and he was tempted for 40 days, and he was ministered to by angels. Again, he is, we, we, we've noted in our series on intercessory prayer, whenever people are going before God, they're doing business with God. They are contributing to the deliberation there. And Jesus is, they are praying. And we know, based on what Jesus has said in a passage just before this, that Satan is conspiring against his disciples. Uh, in verse 31, he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. So we know that Satan is conspiring against his disciples, and also he's conspiring against Jesus, right? We know from the temptation of Jesus, if Satan can find any way to derail this plan for God to establish his reign in the world through his son Jesus, that's good. So if we need to tempt him to get him to fall into sin, we'll do it that way. Take him out, that sounds good too. So Satan is working, and so Jesus is praying. And again, I think that it changes the tone and it changes the energy of the prayer when you're aware that it's a spiritual battle. It makes it there be an urgency. And finally, finally, we see that Jesus prays in great agony. Again, it says he sweated like great drops of blood. Now, I've heard growing up, I used to hear he was actually sweating blood. And I think maybe that has something to do with how the King James translates it. I'm not, I'm not sure. Do you have a King James with you? What is it? How does he translate it? Do you know? Let me see what verse does that mean? Luke twenty two verse forty four. And being in that agony, he prayed more earnestly. Mm -hmm. Hold on, you you skipped a, you skipped a page. Yeah, his little his little Gideon pages didn't turn right. Okay. Forty-four. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Still doing it. Okay, here we go. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling yeah. down to the ground. Yeah. 
So again, even there, it's more of a comparison. So I don't think Jesus is sweating blood. I've heard people say, like, how does that actually happen? There's some weird medical condition. But it's it's a comparison. He says, as it were. As it were, Jesus yeah. Not and, and, blood, right, so right, blood. yeah, by way of com a simile there. So, but, but I think that communicates, again, just the anxiety, right? If In Israel's culture, if they sacrificed a bunch of animals, they would have known what it was like to have blood falling to the ground. It would have doesn't just drop in little bits it's profusely so he's again just you don't you don't work up a sweat like that unless something big is going on you're anxious and so he's in agony it's not he's not even to the cross yet but he's agonizing over what is to come and in the in the present uh, and so we see are you saying that Satan knew ahead of time what he was doing so he's trying to stop him from it that way spiritual warfare no not, no no not not that he was trying to prevent Jesus from going to the cross but just that if, if he can get rid of the sun somehow, right? There's a church tradition that uh, our church fathers teach this, that one, one, of the, one of the purposes of the death of Jesus was to trick Satan. Now, I, there's some, I have some questions about that. But it's basically Satan, Satan's gamble was if I kill Jesus, then he's done. But then, aha, he's not done because the resurrection gives him victory. It makes it seem as if death has succeeded for a day, for you know, 36 hours until Jesus emerges from the tomb. But but nevertheless, but there is a spiritual struggle going on. That's what I wanted to draw attention to. So we learn as we, again, think about the, the, the ministry of Jesus. We see that he is praying, and the Gospel of Luke, Jesus prays regularly. It's not just a rare thing. He often is going, withdrawing to pray. Uh, multiple times he goes on a mountain to pray, and always significant things happen when he does that. Uh, so there's just the struggle of prayer. But the next thing I want us to focus is kind of the disciples' response. I want us to think about apathy, the struggle to pray. Now, March Madness starts tomorrow. So, you know, I don't know if you've made a bracket or you're going to watch, but 11.15 a.m., you know, be ready, turn on CBS because it's go time. And Judy's smiling over there. She's about to watch those cats uh, go. Uh, college basketball tournament. Yeah, okay. But have you ever watched a basketball game and seen the players look bored? that are on the court? <laughs> no. They might be bored on the bench, but if they're on the court, they're not bored. You know, maybe if they're down by like 20 with 90 seconds to go, you might see some players looking kind of apathetic. But even, maybe not, you know, some people will still go to the end. But if you're playing basketball, you're playing basketball, right? But have you ever fallen asleep praying? I know I have. I mean, it happens to the disciples here, it happens to me at least once a week, okay? The disciples fall asleep. They they, they pray, and, and in Luke, yeah, they're tired. Well, and, and Luke gives a reason here. Matthew really focuses on their failure to stay awake. Right? Matthew records Jesus going back three times. You know, why are you sleep? wake up? Keep praying. Go go some praise. Go back. Why are you all still sleeping? Go start praying. Luke doesn't have that back and forth, but the stress that he says in verse 55, 40, 45 is that they were sleeping for sorrow. Right, there still is an emphasis on the disciples' weakness. Okay. Again, Jesus is aware of the upcoming trial, and it's leading him to pray more. And again, they don't know as much as Jesus knows, but they're not taking the trial as seriously, even though Jesus has really elevated what he's doing. Again, we, the Gospels don't record a long speech like Luke doesn't, like the Gospel of John does, but I mean, he's had a very intimate night with the disciples. And yet they're tired. But they struggle to pray. Even though they should be praying, as Jesus instructed them two times, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And I want us to think about for ourselves, and just be honest for a second. Do you ever struggle to pray? Do you ever struggle to pray? There could be a lot of reasons, right? And I think we can reflect on them. Sometimes we pray because we're angry with God. We don't we're confronted by something in the Bible, we're discouraged with an experience we're having in the present, and we just don't, our heart isn't there. Sometimes we pray because we might be afraid of God. What if God really does show up and answer my prayer, or what if he doesn't? Or maybe we're thinking, I know people, they think God's angry with them, and so they won't go to pray because they're afraid of his anger. Yeah, Drew? What about the walls of ears? What do you mean? The other guy's nails, 
security talk and pray to God. Oh, yeah. Drew's saying like if you're and praying out, if you're praying, loud. if you're praying out loud, and there's you live in a house with other people. Yeah, that's a different situation, I think. But because um, uh, even here they've withdrawn to go somewhere, right? They're not. Uh, yeah. I talked to a friend today. I said, you know, said, what are you doing today? He said, I kind of had a day where I just, he, he's a pastor. He's like, I just had to stay home and just kind of meditate on scripture and be with the Lord. You know, that, that, that's who he was doing. But, but still, I, I think, you know, sometimes we don't pray because we don't sure if our prayers are making a difference. Right? Maybe God has said no so many times. We don't think he'll say yes, and we just don't think it's worth spending the time. Or maybe we feel like we need to do something. I think this is what pulls one of the things that pulls me the most is how, how can I pray when I have so many things to do, right? If I if I don't pray, it's, or, or if I do pray, if I spend time not praying, it means that X, Y, and Z are not going to get done, and those have to get done. And I think that reflects this, the pace of our modern life. Also, though, our desire to substitute the spiritual work of prayer for the human work of our own doing. And sometimes I think just, again, we're just so busy. We're busy and we're distracted, right? Even if you're in your 80s here today, right? A couple of y'all and a couple on the line here. You're more distracted probably than your grandparents were. Now, there's always things in life that can get us, but if you just think about the pace of modern life that the automobile brings, that shopping can bring, that watching TV or having a phone, a smartphone, the internet, social media, things that if you have a an empty second of time, there's somebody ready to take that from you. Um, I, you know, studies have shown that for years and years, Americans, you know, they spend like on average four hours a day watching TV, right? It's like some long, long number. And like my generation, if you like, they, they don't even count TV time, they just count screen time. And uh, I always get a disappointing report every Sunday on how many hours a day I've been looking at my, the screen on my phone. Uh, and yeah, I just, I'm not even going to tell you because it's a sad, sad number. But but what they've come to find out, there's people, the way they talk about it now is that people who create TV shows, they're creating content. And on the internet, it's full of content. They're just trying, trying to fill you up with content. And like Netflix, who, you know, one of the main ways that my, people in my generation watch TV, like, what, like they found that the, the main thing that they were bumping up against to prevent people from watching more Netflix was sleep. So then they're trying to think, well, how can we get people to sleep less so they can watch more Netflix? Maybe we'll let people watch at one and a half times speed so that way they can watch even more stuff. Hmm. Now, I say all this because I think these are real things. If you, need, if you need to have space in your life, in your day to pray, but you can sit down, you wake up in the morning and you turn on the news and you just, you know, as soon as you're, as soon as you're up and awake, the news is on. Or again, you, you, you're, happens now. I mean, in some ways it's nice. You go to the DMV and you know you're going to be there for three hours. It's not comfortable. You can't read because there's too many people talking. But you could maybe read on your phone, you know. You don't need to. We don't have space for God. And I think this is one of the going to be one of the biggest challenges for the church moving forward. Uh, unless something big changes, uh, we're going to be distracted. And this is just, and it's not just us, it's everybody. That's why people don't. Uh, I, I heard something recently that said, you know, even talking about youth ministry, 30 years ago, youth ministry filled a void in kids' lives because, you know, their parents are watching TV, they don't have anything to do, they're out running around town, and they could go to youth group. They said, but now youth group is, the, the needs for students are different. It's not that kids are just, you know, for, for, by and large, it's not that kids have, you know, their parents don't care and they're just roaming around free, latchkey kids, you might have heard that term before. But kids are so, they're, they're, they go to school, and when they leave school, they go to sports, and when they leave sports, they go to tutoring, and when they leave tutoring, they go to you know, the next lesson, and then maybe they have a job to work. There's not time. And, uh, and we, some, we, if we're not guilty, we'll, we'll buy into that ourselves and even contribute to it. But all of these factors, I, the reason I'm bringing all these things together is because they can lead to a lack of prayer. And it's dangerous because if we're not praying, then we're at risk of not listening to Jesus. So Jesus gets betrayed. Judas shows up. He kisses Jesus. Jesus, you know, you're going to betray me with a kiss, huh? That's how you're going to do it? And the disciples are they're kind of realizing what's about to happen. And what do they do? They, they ask Jesus in verse 50, Lord, 
shall we strike with the sword? And before Jesus can even say a word, someone's on the servant of the high priest, cutting his ear off. Which was not what Jesus wanted them to do, because he had to undo that. He had to heal the man. If we don't pray, we're going to be at risk in doing things ourselves. We, we will fall into the trial. We will not be ready when temptation comes or the trial comes. And again, we just contrast for a second the unpreparedness of the disciples with the readiness of Jesus. Right? His response to betrayal is kind of like, again, he, they're going to do it. It sounds like the suffering servant, Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus is not done talking quite yet. But he does accept the reality of what is to come. Joel Green, who's a, a New Testament scholar, writes about this, that in contrast to the disciples, Jesus demonstrates that the way to remain triumphant, and triumphant here measured as a persistent obedience to the divine will, the way to remain triumphant in the time of trial is through persistent, earnest, and submissive prayer. Right? We need to be constantly in prayer so we know this. So here are some questions for our discipleship as I come to a close, some things for us to think about. We need to prioritize prayer in our lives as a church. So as we get ready for Easter, if this is not a habit in your life, try to find a time, a ten, solid 10-minute ten uninterrupted window where you can pray every single day. If you can do more than 10 minutes, great, but you start with baby steps. So try to find, if, so if 10 minutes is too much, start with five and work up to 10, but find at least a 10-minute window of time every day to be dedicated in prayer. Sometimes you'll realize that it takes a couple minutes just to stop talking in your head, right? The busy, just get the busyness out. The next is I want us to think about our activity, especially whenever we enter into a situation that is urgent, right? Like the disciples found themselves in. They were in an unexpected, unprecedented situation, and they didn't really have time to, they didn't have time to pray and act. Try to work in those times and those pieces in your life to just stop and pray. You might not have 10 minutes to pray. You might only have 10 seconds, right? If you read the book of Nehemiah, right? It's Nehemiah chapter 1. He goes the, to the, he, he gets new, he, he, he goes to like the king's court and he just, he just prays on the spot. He, he doesn't have time to go to his prayer closet. He has to pray in the moment. But we just want to ask God for wisdom. It doesn't mean that we're not going to make mistakes. That's the danger we risk if we overcompensate on that. But we still want to we want to slow down, pray, and then go. We're asking for God's guidance. And finally, I want us to think about the betrayal of Judas. I didn't focus on that in this lesson, but he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which wasn't nothing, but it also wasn't everything. And I just want us to think in our own walks and in our in our our walk with the Lord and our relationship with Him, what are we at risk of leading us into betrayal? Pray that you would not enter into temptation. What would tempt us? And be honest. Be honest with yourself and be honest with God about what that is. And then pray that the Lord would deliver you from that. So that whenever the trial comes and the temptation comes, we're ready. We are praying. We're ready to receive from the Lord rather than to take things into our own hands. So that's, that's it for tonight. Let me say a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time to gather with your people to study your word. Father, I pray that you would help us uh, to be a people who pray. Father, help us to not suffer from apathy as the disciples did. Help us to not suffer from sorrow like they did, such that it prevents us to pray. But God, would you lead us to understand that prayer is an act that requires energy. Father, as Jesus was left exhausted after he prayed, Father, may we, at times in our life, be exhausted from the prayers that we, the time that we spend praying. Help us to make prayer an active thing in our life where we don't fall asleep, but rather one where we are constantly coming to you. Father, we pray that you would lead us not into temptation, but rather that you would deliver us from the evil one. Guard us from the attacks that might come against us by helping us to put on the armor of God, which you pro provided. And Father, would you help us to be like Jesus and to exalt him and to glorify him. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen.